I am Jackie Horwood. I'm the, the um, panel convener for tonight. I am um, a former convener with State Sisters in Crime, uh, currently with the Australian Crime Lawyers Association. I am pleased with uh, Sisters in Crime Australia to, um, in, to welcome you to tonight's panel, Small Towns, Big Crimes. It's 2022 and we thought we'd be meeting in person, but yet here we are Zooming again. And we we're just discussing the, the pros and cons of um, the environment we're in. We miss being at the rising sun and the noise and the joy of being together and having camp, you know, caramel sticker camera in your, her, our faces. But the advantage is the accessibility. You can be anywhere in Victoria, in Australia, around the world and, and be with us, which is fantastic. So greetings to everyone who's here with us. At the outset, on behalf of Sisters in Crime Australia, we acknowledge the traditional owners of country throughout Australia, and recognise their continuing uh, connection to land and waters and culture. We pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. So thank you very much. Tonight, we are speaking to three fabulous authors. We have Emma Viskich, if you want to wave, Emma. <laughs> Aoife Clifford and Mary Rose Cuskily. And we're going to talk about what happens when crime leaves the mean streets of our big cities to stalk small town Australia. We're going to just talk uh, flat out for about 35 minutes and then we'll have a draw for three $150 um, crime book packs, which is very good. Now, let me introduce our esteemed panel. Emma Viskich's critically acclaimed Caleb Zellick novels have been published worldwide. The series has won a Ned Kelly and an unprecedented five David Awards. Her debut novel, Resurrection Bay, was shortlisted for the UK's prestigious Gold Dagger and New Blood Awards and for a Barry Award in the US. Um, Emma was formerly a classicist whose musical career ranged from performing with Jose Carreras to Dame Kiri de Kanawa, while also busking for beer for money in St Kilda. And haven't we all done that? Those Who Perished, which I'm sad to say is the thrilling finale of a groundbreaking Caleb Zellick series, is out with Echo Publishing in March. Welcome, Emma. Hello, everybody. Hello. <laughs> Aoife Clearford is the author of the best-selling literary crime novels, Sight, which was highly commended in Sister in Crime, Sisters in Crime, David Awards, and All These Perfect Strangers, which was long listed for both the ABR General Fiction Book of the Year Award and the Voss Literary Prize. She's won a Ned Kelly Award and a 2007 Scarlet Stiletto Award, followed by six category awards in subsequent years. Aoife also took out the SD Harvey Short Story Award, which was formerly part of the Ned Kelly Awards and has been shortlisted for the US Oh, sorry, the UK Crime Association's debut dagger, among other prizes. Her award-winning stories have been published in Australia and the UK and the US. Aoife's third novel, When We Fall, and I should be holding these books up. This is this is Emma's, Those Those Who Perish, beautiful cover. And this is Aoife's When We Fall. And When We Fall is also out in March, and it was published by Ultimo Press. Please welcome Aoife. Yay. Just imagine smoky. Rising in the sun, people clapping. Mary Rose Cuskily is the author of uh, Wedderburn, A True Tale of Blood and Dust, published by Alan and Unwin in 2018. And that was long, last, long lusted, long listed, the best debut and best true crime in the 2019 David Awards. For in 2016, she won the New England Thunderbolt for Crime Writing Nonfiction uh, Award for her essay, Well Before Dark, about the disappearance of Bakai schoolgirl Marilyn Warman in 1972. The Cane, there it is, her debut novel just came out with Alan and Unwin and returns to some of the themes and the preoccupations of that essay. So please welcome Mary Rose. All right, Mary Rose, yay. <laughs> so tonight's theme is all about um, crime in rural and regional Australia. And we've got a term for it at the moment, rural noir. So what defines rural noir? Is it just a crime book set in rural and regional Australia or are there elements to that story that makes it essentially noir? Who wants to start with that PhD topic? <laughs> I'll, 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 I'm going to volunteer, volunteer Mary Rose. <laughs> <laughs> I think rural noir kind of overlaps a bit with, you know, Australian Gothic, I guess, and I think it's, it's broader... That term rural noir takes in 
something broader than just a crime in a rural or regional area. And um, I think these kind of stories have got a really long history in Australia. You know, you can go back to um, Marcus, uh, Marcus Clark with the term of his natural life, even, you know, paintings like Lost with Frederick McCubbin, you know, the girl in the eucalyptus forest, the drover's wife, Picnic Hanging Rock. I see them all in kind of rural noir, I guess. And then, of course, you've got, you know, the Secret River, Wimmera, even, you know, Emily Maguire's isolated mm. incident. And I think they're kind of, yeah. you know, they are set in the bush, yeah. yeah, in in small towns and all that sort of thing. But I often associate them with there's like this some kind of lurking menace that's often it's located within the landscape as well. And also, you know, feral animals, work stand clothing, you know, isolated buildings, yeah. pubs. They all, I think, for me, those kind of are all encompassed in rural noir. Mm. Aoife, Emma, do you have thoughts about that one? Yeah, I mean, I, I guess everyone defines things differently. But, but for me, um, very similar to Mary Rose, um, there's, it has to be a sense of brooding menace, really. Mm. Um, it, it often, I mean, go, going back, absolutely, um, you know, you've got Wake and Fright, and books like that oh, yeah. um, and it, it's the menace for me is more coming from the people um, and and maybe it's their reaction to the landscape because you get into all sorts of really interesting you know discussions about colonialism and what what isn't what is a, a threatening landscape is it because you're out of place it's an, or is it the landscape and, and and for me it's because the people are out of place um, so I yeah I think it just needs that that feeling of um, of menace and claustrophobia, really, which you, you can have a crime novel set in a small town without mm. that. You can you can certainly have cosy. You can even have quite grim murders, but you you don't have that feeling of uh, claustrophobia. Yeah, Aoife, did you want to? Yeah, I, I I really do agree with what both um, Mary Rose and Emma have said because, for example, I would sort of not put my book in a, that noir kind of setting because, for me, I'm from a country town and I realise in my novels I deliberately want to make the country town a place where you'd actually want to go to mm -hmm. um, so even though there's a terrible murder that's taken place it's not at it's not kind of the tip of the iceberg of a town that's falling apart and totally dysfunctional with awful things happening all the time and that brooding menace that Emma kind of mentioned it's a town where because sometimes sometimes like if you go with the, you know the real wake and fright kind of um kind of books you sort of go well why are they in that town mm. why would you just not get up and leave and so I like the idea of that these towns are functioning they work their communities it's a strong community and that they're having to deal with an awful event in it but that that awful event will not kind of define them and that's probably one of the reasons why I make my towns fictional because I would feel really bad about giving a small town a terrible event and that be kind of one of the few fictional representations of that town and literature, whereas I would not feel the same way about Melbourne, whatever, you know, that can cope with whatever you write about it because it's a big town with lots of, big city with lots of, lots of interpretations of it. But I kind of feel a bit for these country towns with that, you know, are so brooding and horrible and awful. So, uh, yeah, so like Emma, yeah, yeah. And so just the fact that you're writing about a country town does not necessarily make you noir, I think. Yeah. But I think you're right, If I think that's the two distinct threads that we see, small town, interlinked families, friends, and something bad happens and the way they cope. And then there's that what Emma and Mary Rose are talking about, about that brooding mm. fear. And Mary Rose, you talk, you really use that in the cane because you make almost make the cane fields it's set in far north Queensland in the cane fields for those who have not yet read it. Um, you you make those cane fields a menace in itself. You talk about the kids running past them and hearing a noise and, and feeling the fear from them. Yeah. And so you, you use that that brooding fear. Yes. And it's kind of the landscape that has the kind of menace in it in the cane is is a man made landscape. Mm. And I kind of want to, it's a bit fanciful, I suppose, but in I wanted to, you know, explore a bit or talk a bit about 
or just meditate upon what happens in a landscape after repeated kind of desecrations, I suppose, you know, starting with, you know, the dispersal and violence against Aboriginal people to bringing, um, you know, South Sea Islanders against their will to work in the cane fields, to destroying the natural environment. And so in the cane, the sugar cane itself is kind of the receptacle, I suppose, for that. Yeah, and it, it's, and it's, it's almost, it, you're right, that layering of history and the history builds the menace or the, there, there are layers of history that stay in the landscape and, and they're a part of what the landscape becomes. I'm going to totally yeah. hack this line, Mary Rose. Oh, go for it, go for it. <laughs> but Mary, Mary Rose, you had a beautiful line about um, the, the, the ground was thirsty for blood. Mm. Um, I really, yeah, that just sort of went, oh. Yeah, I absolutely could um, feel myself in that place. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah, I think yeah, that was, yes, about yes, the, 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 the that the land had got a taste for blood, mm, or that something, was, yeah. yes, and it couldn't. Yeah, you, you put it better. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you're right, and it, it it does build on that menace, that sense that you can't control what's going on around you mm. when you're reading the book. So, uh, if you you're saying your book is not noir. Mary Rose and Emma, do you think your books fall in that category? I always have trouble categorising my own books. Um, I, I don't write to a genre or a, I, I don't think that much about how other people are going to perceive where it's going to fit, you know, in things. So I'm often a little surprised where they put it. So when Resurrection Bay first came out, um, people were calling it modern noir and I went, oh, Oh, okay. That that's a really interesting definition. I'm going to sit and think about that, and 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 I do agree with it. Um, I didn't necessarily set out to to write it, but 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 yeah, I think I, I think I do agree with it because um, it, I, I wanted that close claustrophobic feel. I mean, so it was more about the story and the feel of it. Um, and in yeah. retrospect, I can sort of put a label on it. Yeah. Yeah. Mary Rose, I think yours definitely falls in it. What do you think? Well, it's it's on the cover, so <laughs> <laughs> must be true. <laughs> if Mark Brandy says it is, then it is. Oh, well, that's but, you. Uh, <laughs> no, but I'm I'm pretty yeah, and because I hadn't, you know, I was um, when I, I when that you know was presented to me, I was quite that you know that was Mark's line, and mm -hmm. I think oh yeah, no, that's I, I felt that kind of sat well with me so I was quite happy for the cane to be seen as rural noir yeah yeah good so you know we're discussing your all your books are set in small regional towns and the attractions of these stories I think for a lot of readers is that uncovering of secrets and the deep interconnectedness of people in these towns how do you plot for this how do you work out all the links and the relationships and the secrets do you do that beforehand or does it does it come up as you're going there are people, there are generations of people, there are friends. It all connects. How do you work it all out so that it all unflows beautifully for us readers? Oh, I'm going to ask Aoife. I want to know from Aoife. <laughs> I want to hear your answer um, first. Well, yeah, Before I, I admit. <laughs> so, um, I say the answer, do you plot? The answer is no, the simple answer. Um, but I guess the more complicated answer is, yeah, I do. It's my first draft. So um, it's messy and it's unwieldy. And to be honest, I'm really happy when it's done and I can start editing because I'm really far more comfortable when everything's there and I can see it and then I can work out some of those connections that I didn't necessarily see first time around. Mm. Um, so that's a lot of fun. But the bit of doing that, for, the way that works for me, if I perfectly plotted out my books beforehand, I would not write them because I know the answers to everything. Whereas mm. the joy of that first draft is to find out what happened. So you've 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 set yourself the knot, and it's to try and undo it and work it out. Oh, and nice. so yeah. that's that. So you kind of, in a sense, can be a reader as well. So sometimes when something suddenly happens that you weren't expecting, I'm as shocked as everybody else by the time you do it. But then it's all the drafting afterwards that that makes it work properly but um still like it, it, it that's the great fun of it is when it surprises you do you uh, sort of go oh I didn't see that oh absolutely <laughs> in fact um I was writing a bit of my next book today and that exact thing happened to is like oh my god 
I can't believe it. So, yeah, um, that is like a good writing day when that happens, as opposed to, oh, my God, I cannot How do I get out of this? Now. <laughs> <laughs> so it's, uh, yeah, the highs and lows of not actually um, <laughs> plotting. Oh, well, I'm actually relieved to hear you say that. <laughs> uh, yeah, no, I, I know nothing when I start. Um, if I'm really lucky, I've got a, a few scenes and I'm writing towards them. But I, uh, I don't so much have a clean first draft where I've worked it all out. I, I spend the entire time I'm writing the book working out the connections and going, oh, oh, no, and then rewriting. Um, but it's that feeling that everything has to be connected. Yeah, Mary yeah. Rose, because you, you, you've got a, your story takes, a, like there's a lot of generational stuff in there as well. Yeah. Um, look, plotting, I'm not, because, uh, you know, fiction's not kind of really my first love, it's, you know, it's something I've come to kind of late. So I, but I, I didn't work out the plot. It's kind of, it comes pretty late. Like plotting usually comes late. I tend to, um, you know, there'll be like a conversation or a scene and I'll write that and then maybe I'll write another one that happens kind of somewhere else and then I'm trying to connect them somehow. So it's kind of plotting usually happens like plot features like, you know, key relationships or turning points or whatever. They kind of, they emerge as I write and rewrite mm. and which is not very efficient at all. Um, so I kind of, you know, when I've heard, Jane Harper talk about how she's got it all worked out before she starts and she knows how it's going to end. It's just like, I'm so, it just sounds so much more efficient and so less painful than um, what I found. Well, I think that's pretty rare. If you speak to most people, they, they, they're pretty, most people are pretty much pantsers and just start with it. They have an idea. Yeah. Like idea of what the end might look like and just go into it. Is that how everyone else sort of writes? I, think yeah, I, a, I mean, I think it's a time, sorry, Emma, I think it is a time thing. If you've got to produce a book a year, then um, you've got to know that, you, that you're that you going to get to the end and it's going to be right. Whereas if you're just um, letting it unfold, then you've got to give yourself time to potentially backtrack. And sometimes I do have to backtrack and um, just head, head in a slightly different direction to make things link up. So that all takes time. So um I understand why Jane would be plotting very carefully before she picks up a pen. <laughs> I think it's also just the way your brain works as well. Yeah. I mean, um, my books are entirely retro-engineered. I mean, I go backwards, <laughs> forwards, up, down, you know. I probably write three books for one. I have tried to write more efficiently mm. and it's it dead. It's, you know, mm -hmm. Frankenstein's monster, but without the electricity going through it, that gets chucked. But I know people who have, um, they're just, they've just got a, 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 a clearer mm. thought process, a more lineal thought process, and, and, and it suits them um, to, to work forward in that direction. So I really just think it comes down to who you are. And yeah. it might also change a bit as yeah. well. I know people who, mm. who really have changed the, the way they, they do it. Yeah, and also it, it's at certain points in the process I find okay okay and I, I now I just need something here so yes it's kind of a bit reverse engineer where you go like I'll have um you know part of a manuscript but then go oh okay now this something needs to happen here so well that's you know, Chandler's okay. Chandler's thing when in doubt have a man come through the door with a gun in his hand maybe mix it up a little bit you know yeah. maybe have a taser in his hand or something but yeah yeah. Doesn't work for check off, just put the gun on the wall and wait. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. it, it, it's interesting to hear people's different approaches. And when you hear someone like Solari Gentle, who who is amazingly prolific and writes lots of books, but she starts and she says, I never know how it's going to end. I never know who's done it. But she also, but Solari, I was thinking of Solari as we were talking yeah. about this as the craziest person that I have ever talked to about this process because she's so different. She never has to rewrite. No. How does she do that? It's magic. Yeah, no, she's yeah. amazing. Yeah, she's she's Lee, yeah. Lee Child's like that. He starts at the beginning. Yeah. And he keeps writing. Um, yeah, that's yeah. Well, teach his own and we love it all. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Mary Rose, I want to ask you, your book is seven, set in the 70s. Your book became, for those who haven't seen it, um, set in the 70s, and you never state 
that it's in the 70s. You never mm. state where it is in the 70s, and yet we know it is in the 70s. Why did you not want to give it a specific time frame overtly? And how did you go about dropping that information in so that we knew exactly where we were? Yeah, I mean, I suppose partly because the cane isn't based on a particular event, but it has a similar beginning you know, start it, well, it, has, it starts with a similar crime and a similar landscape of a real event. So I didn't want to set it in that town where Marilyn Woman disappeared in 1972, but I wanted it somewhere in that uh, era and somewhere in that area. So I guess it's kind of a bit of a parallel universe. So it's, you know, both, so the time of the novels is a little bit slippery, I suppose, but I mean, they're kind of the obvious Kind of shortcuts i guess you know slipping in cultural references to you know number 96 or jermaine greer or matlock police or the music of carol king but it was also um when i i did a lot of reading of newspapers from the time and a lot of it was just you know looking at the advertisements for the clothes that people were wearing and things like you know columns about you know what are we going to eat tonight and things like that and so dropping those sorts of things in. But it was also, I think, trying to um, recreate some of those kind of social attitudes and mores just through the dialogue. Yeah. And, um, and you know, some, like there was that, uh, like the, um, the Little Red School book kind of plays an important part in terms of a subplot. Mm. So that was a real, um, you know, publication that was banned in Australia because they were afraid, you know, it was going to just spread licens you know, licentiousness and um, anarchy throughout, you know, young people. So things like that, I suppose, that I worked into the plot as well. Um, and also I think just trying to get back into having a bit of an ear for that dialogue, which is kind of the, you know, it's the, the voices of my childhood, those, mm. and just being able to, get back into that those rhythms of speech yeah and I remember again, still pretty strongly it from does that have time. that slower feel to it too that you know at a time where where things moved a bit slower as well when you when you read it it has that nice slow beat to it as well yeah, yeah 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 I mean even though you know the 70s were just you know there were this kind of quite tumultuous time socially and culturally and um you know lots of upset and you know particularly you know in rural communities you know, but just even, well, in Queensland, I'm talking particularly because of, you know, Joe Bajelke Peterson was such a strong presence in the state. And, you know, you know Gough Whitlam was about to be um, elected, you know, they were recognising Red China. There was this, you know, real and palpable fear of, you know, communism and the Red Menace and things like that. So, um, so I suppose, you know, I, uh, obviously and not so obviously, I tried to um, work those into the novel in a way that felt authentic. Yeah, and you, you were just saying you grew up in a, a small farming town in Queensland. You didn't grow up in a, the, the cane fields, but you did no. grow up in a small town. Did you, how did you go about getting back into that mindset of being in a small town? Did you find it easy or did it take a while to get back into that, how it felt to grow up in a small area like that? Yeah, well, I grew up in a, like a, a dairy farm and, you know, but this little town was, you know, just a mile away sort of thing. So. Really, um, I look like going back to just those newspapers, that really helped just like, you know, looking at the, the letters to the paper and uh, remembering, because I, I have sisters who are a bit older than me and so they were adults and living in Brisbane and, you know, coming back home and arguing politics. And so it was just kind of remembering those conversations and, um, and those attitudes and, and also just things like, and, and there are some things that, lodge quite deeply like those kind of emotional those things with emotional hooks like the anxiety of my mother when there were these child disappearances even though they didn't happen you know near us but you know all over the state parents were frantically um you know afraid for their children and so just that um so those emotional things kind of hook in and I think they leave a real trace that you that you're able to well that I was able to you know access yeah, well, you've been upfront about, you know, the seed to this book being from small, from from real cases that have come from the area. Can you tell us about those cases and what they meant to you and how they stuck in your head? 
Yeah, so in 1970, two young girls, Judith and Susan Mackay, they were um, abducted um, in Townsville. They were waiting at a bus stop and they were found a couple of days later, you know, raped and murdered. I mean, it was terrible and never solved. And there's a photograph that I came across again when I was researching and that I'm pretty sure that I saw at the time, which is this photo of their father about to stride across to the riverbed where they, the riverbed where his, where they had found his daughters and these two police officers trying to hold him back. And so just, so that was just one image. And then the story of Marilyn Warman. So she went missing in 1972 and she was going, she was riding her bicycle down a track between two cane fields and down to the main road to catch the bus into Mackay. And her brothers who went to the local primary school were just 10 minutes behind her and they came along and they found her bike lying on its side with the wheel still turning. And the older boy, like he was only 11 or something, ran back to the house and the younger boy stayed by Marilyn's bicycle and he heard her calling out in the cane. And so she was never found, they never found out what happened to her. And yeah. for Mackay, it was like they still talk about Mackay as before Marilyn Woman and after Marilyn Woman. It was this mm -hmm. huge thing in the town. Mm. And I had friends who grew up in Mackay, went to boarding school, and so I had friends who grew up in Mackay. And so it was, and just her family were very um, determined to keep her name in, in, in the public uh, consciousness. So they have campaigned kind of. Well, it's this for 50 years. It's 50 years this year since Marilyn went missing. Oh, wow. And so there's always, so regularly things pop up. And because I'm attuned to it, I kind of see them when they pop mm. up about, you know, they're digging up some backyard or they've increased the, um, the reward or whatever. And in fact, it was only, and, and I did actually meet um, Rex Warman, who was that little boy by the, by the, bis, by the bicycle. And... Um, so they only had a funeral for her in 2015 because it wasn't until then that they, that a piece of bone that it, someone had found a couple of years after she went missing, mm -hmm. they were able to extract some mitochondrial DNA that linked it back to Marilyn's mother. And so they only had a funeral for her in 2015. So, and but just because, and but, but even before that, I think it was just those images, the father being held back by the policeman and just that even though, and just that image of the, of the bicycle wheel turning in the cane fields. And like they just, and because I was just at that age, you know, I was a bit younger than Marilyn, but walking to school, you know, along country roads, that fear of the adults around me, it just kind of never left me. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, I think we've all got those stories in our childhood. I know Eloise Woolwich was the one for me because I was about the same age when she disappeared at, at her bedroom window. So, yeah, yeah those stories do lodge. They lodge deeply in you. Yeah. 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 Uh, we discussing your book with a, a friend who has read The Cane as well. And we he was saying, Oh, it's got a real true crime feel about it. Like it's it's sort of like you're in the moment and you're listening to all of like a like a true crime book where you're you've got all the voices telling you what they saw and what they remember. It's got that feel to it. Yeah. Yeah. yeah you're not really nicely done. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Eva. A major theme running through your book, which I will hold up again for everyone who has it, doesn't remember. Here it is when we fall. Um, there's a major theme running through your book around parenthood. You have missing parents, you have dead parents, cruel parents. The local museum is holding an exhibition on adoption. The main character, Alex, has a very difficult relationship with her mother who now has dementia. Is that something you are keen to explore and examine in this book? Uh, yes, is the uh, simple answer. I think when I start writing often, I'm pushing a few different unrelated ideas together and sort of see the chemistry that kind of um, comes from that. And so one of the ideas I was kind of struck going into this book, and it's probably the age I am, but I am seeing lots of friends having to navigate the generation above them in their family die and go through that process of wills and things like that. Mm -hmm. And it was striking me that I was seeing a pattern of um, a pattern repeating that, um, you know, obviously grief and all the rest of it, but, you know, the wills where potentially it should be um, 
something of, uh, you know, that potentially you're getting an asset or you're getting money that previously you didn't have, that you would think that would bring with it advantages and, um, uh, yeah. you know, uh, yeah. some, some ease in the, um, in your financial situation, that is sort of like a bit of a good thing. But all these families kind of, it was more like the wills and the um, response to it was like a grenade going off in the family. Oh, wow. And it wasn't just about the money. It was also about, um, uh, relationships and sort of where you fitted in the family suddenly changing overnight and having to kind of grapple with that and um, it sort of happened in my own family too in my extended family when my grandmother died and I could see this pattern happening again and again and I was really kind of interested in it that your set family position suddenly is up for grabs and I really like um, I like writing them and I like reading stories where you have these settled truths that all of a sudden get overturned and then how do we all react to that and what happens from that and of course that can often be the crime as well that um, something's happened people assume it's one thing it's actually someone else or people assume that person did it, it's actually someone else but I wanted to reflect that in the family structure a bit as well and so um, for the two main characters um, Alex and her mum, as you say, they've got a very difficult relationship because they're both very independent people. And so they've kind of kept arm's length from each other, but it works, they made it work for them. That's that's what it is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And um, a combination of Denny, her mum, inheriting the family home, a place that she hasn't been to in a very long time and deciding to go back and live there, um, plus Denny getting an, a diagnosis of um, dementia, um, means that their whole relationships flipped. Denny is more in the position of a child now and both women have to kind of navigate that and also mourn a bit the independence that they both have. That's not going to be the same sort of going forward. And then on top of that, they go walk along a beach and find a severed leg. But underneath that, go out, working out what's happened Thank in relation you. to that is trying to work out how do they deal with each other. And yes. as you say, once I decide I want to talk about something I talk about it in every single form I can so there's literally almost yeah, every form of parenthood that you can have in the book <laughs> but it's great it's great for different viewpoints and, and the impact of the different types of parental experiences on on the people in the book and it comes what? from all different sides absolutely I, I always like sort of exploring the long-term effects of decisions made or trauma or something like that that is there's no easy solves and sometimes the, it's generations worth of hurt and difficulty and sometimes, but probably getting back to, I like exploring it from different angles, you know, that you can see that there's um, good parents too, oh, yeah, yeah. Um, that um, I like there's in the book, there's secret parents, there's parents that have lost their children and then there's Alex who's not a parent and totally fine with it. So yeah. I really wanted to explore all, all views on it. <laughs> of course, you know, the relationship between Alex and Denny is further exacerbated because there are secrets that Denny holds that she will not let go no. of. And, we, and she doesn't let go of it. Even towards the end, we still don't know the answer to a, to various questions. Yeah, and, yeah. and which is life, right? Like yeah, yeah. Um, I always think um, I, I guess I'm not a, uh, someone who likes everything wrapped up neatly. I like, I like them to think like there's a life beyond the page where either these things may never come out or you just learn to deal with it. And part of, I mean, and also part of the book I was really exploring was um, when good people sort of turn the other way. Mm. And that is that um, it's right there in front of you, but you're just not acknowledging it. So um, these secrets, maybe not so secret, but just everyone's kind of agreed not to talk about it, yeah, exactly. uh, which is yeah. life all the time. Oh, yeah, yeah, kind yeah. of just go, yeah, I'm just not going to deal with it. So, yeah, um, yeah. yeah, exactly. And Jenny's um, prime target for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look, when we were, you and I were discussing various things to talk about, you mentioned about Alex being a words person and finding herself in the midst of a riddle that is where all the clues are visual and the difficulty for her coming to terms with that. Do you want to discuss that further? Because Alex is, you know, she's a very much a rules by the book person. She's a lawyer. She's very much about process and words, and she's in the midst of something that she can only interpret by through visual clues. Mm. 
That's well, uh, yeah, I, I, I got the idea actually from a customer that came into the bookstore. And I'll tell this story quickly because I, I know um, I want to hear what Emma's got to say with her answers. But um, uh, what happened was someone came in and they weren't a big book reader, but they really loved fashion. And so they started talking to me about uh, fashion and uh, a book that had come out about fashion. And so then we got on to talking about fashion more generally like I'm not very interested in fashion much myself but she was so engaging on it and then she told me about there was this one dress that she was fixated on she'd seen it 15 years earlier in a shop in Melbourne that she used to walk past and she'd see it in the window she found a picture of it in a magazine and for 15 years she'd kept that picture and she didn't know why she was keeping that picture she'd moved three times every time she thought about throwing it out but she didn't do it and so she so she described it to me and she said, I always wanted to know the story behind the dress, what happened to it. And I said to her, I can tell you because you just described my wedding dress. And no, I was way. Like, no way. Absolutely no way. We couldn't believe it. We thought that just can't be right. So I brought in a picture and sure enough, that was the dress. And that yeah. was, so now I kind of feel like I share that dress with that woman. Like, um, and it just really, and she's actually saving up her pennies at the moment to get an oil painting of my wedding dress oh. because it's so important to her. So it was a real moment of me, a words person, her, a visual person, both going, oh my gosh, and just how, how differently people view the world. And so she, I solved her mystery, but she gave me a great idea for the book. And that's what it was to put a words person in a visual world. How will they survive? Which leads me on to another topic. I'm running out of time, but Emma, there was a Twitter conversation a while back about people who visualise when they write and when they read and people who don't. And I was quite surprised to understand that you don't visualise as you're writing because your books are so visual. It astounds me that that you can't see what you're writing. <laughs> It, it, it's a little like uh, Aoife said that um, she now shares the wedding dress with that woman. I think any book that you put into the world, it's 50% what the reader is mm. bringing to the book. So I can, I give you the books, you are making the picture. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I, I mean, and I spend a lot of time trying to um, sketch in hints so that people can bring, make their own worlds. Uh, but but I, I mean, I didn't realise until a couple of years ago that, like, you can all visualise things in your mind. So, I mean, I, I thought that was all just metaphors. Um, I, it's like, you freaks, what else can you do, you know? <laughs> can you read minds, teleport, levitate? I was like, I had no idea. I was like, oh, how do you all navigate so well? But, yeah, so um, I, I spend a lot of time trying to anchor things, anchor people into the world um, and to give you enough to go on, give readers enough to go on. Um, but I'm, I'm almost building the world up for myself in words. You know those little concrete poems? You might write a poem about a cat and it's in the shape of a cat. Yeah. That's sort of what the writing, writing process is like for me. I, I create it by, by writing the world. So if a character walks onto the scene who I haven't met before, um, I literally just start writing a description and go, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, right. A, a tall, you know, cadaverous looking man with, with a goatee. Oh, yeah, that's who the character is. Right. Okay, we'll go with that. Um, so I just sort of muck around with things until they feel right. Yeah. It's interesting because I think particularly your second book, because there's the, there's the fire, it is so visual to well, read. <laughs> it's not that funny. I'm it astounds me that you're, you're not seeing it as you write it it just yeah. so for, for me it's visceral so I, I'm yeah. very I'm oral and I'm visceral so I I approach writing but and the world through listening I, I mean I'm a terrible eaves, eavesdropper like I will oh, absolutely yeah. if you are there I'm eavesdropping on you yeah, yeah, yeah I'm the same yeah and and in early writing early drafts are very much they're almost like a play scripts I get to know the characters, you know, and I'll get them chatting for pages until I sort of work out. But once someone will say something interesting eventually, by that time, hopefully I'm, I'm in the story. So when I'm writing, um, I, I don't know what I'm seeing. I'm not seeing the computer, but I'm, I'm in, I'm just in that, that world. I'm in that character's head. So I'm, I'm there. I'm, I'm yeah. just there. Yeah. So maybe that's different. You're actually seeing, seeing it through their eyes rather than outside. Well, I'm not seeing it. I'm just feeling yeah. it. <laughs> I'm just, uh, you know, I'm just, yeah, I'm just, I'm just there. I, I do wonder if it's a little bit like um, being completely blind from birth. 
that you are just in the world. Um, yeah, uh, w- when I'm writing, I mean that that sensation. I'm just there, but I, I can't I can't see it. No. Yeah, it's, I see. I thought everyone could see what they were reading. Yeah, <laughs> I was a little surprised when I found out you could. So yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you in your book, and then we'll hold up the book just so everyone remembers those who perish. Um, you've taken the secretive small town theme and you've taken it further because not only has Caleb gone back to Resurrection Bay, his little small town of, of his birth and his childhood, but he's now in a small, very secretive island, Mutton, Mutton Bird Island. Mm. Was And I looked up Mutton Bird Island. There's one in New South Wales. There's not one in Victoria. So, not that one. <laughs> yeah. Is it based on anything particular, any experiences, or what were you hoping to explore by taking Caleb out of that small town into something even smaller and even more close-knit? Yeah, I think uh, um, I actually got the idea for it uh, years ago when I was writing um, the second Caleb book. Um, it, it, it's not so much based on a place, but it's inspired by, by a couple of places. Um, one I won't mention for cultural reasons, um, but the other one is French Island down okay. Port Phillip Bay which is um, somebody mentioned it and said, oh, I'll come bird watching there. And, and I went and Mutton Bird Island is this really farming community, but it's, it, there's no council rules there. Cars don't have red joke plates. Everything's just, um, it's very um, sort of raw and uh, there's no, no town water and, and things like that. And that, that just sort of stayed in my brain. And there's also a quarantine hospital down that way. Oh, yeah, um, right, and yeah. I really wanted to set something in a quarantine hospital. And thank you, COVID, because then COVID came along when I was sort of starting this book and I had to take out all my metaphors about viruses and things because, like, it was just like, who, no one wants to read about COVID. I don't want to read about COVID. So I had to take that, <laughs> that side of things out. So the setting was there for a long time. Um, and it took me a little while to work out when I was going to use it, but when I, I always knew the Caleb series was was going to be short and tight you you know like a lot of things happen and and Caleb and all the characters need to grow and change Mm. and it wasn't until um I sort of got maybe towards the end of writing the second book that I I knew where it was going to finish and I knew that it would become a homecoming of types for Caleb that he's going to return to where he was born and, and grew up um but I wanted to make it far more claustrophobic than that oh Island, island. Um, so I, I, yeah, I, I actually had the setting um, before I wrote the first word, which is unusual for me, actually. But you um, had that idea that that um, experience in your head ready for, for Caleb down the track. Yeah, I just didn't know when I was going, going to use it. It's, it's always nice because you have these things and, and sometimes you don't get to use them or you hope that you will one day. Um, and it's about writing, waiting for that right moment. Um, and I... I I, I'm the opposite of Aoife. I, I like to make my towns really. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you evil woman. <laughs> places, you know, I've, I've lived in many country towns and I sort of, I grew up in a place a bit like a country town as well, not, not on the outskirts of Melbourne, but um, with no sort of infrastructure around it. So it had that very tightly, um, you know, tight knit feel to it. Um, and I love them. I mean, I, I don't feel the same way as, <laughs> about them as my books, uh, but for me, they're like a big family. Mm. And I love writing about families. I love writing about relationships. Um, we've all got some, you know, type of family, whether it's um, your friends who become your family or your birth family or whatever it is. And it's that uh, the tension of rubbing up against the same people day after day and, and, and the support as well. And it, it, but it's, a, it's for me, it's a, it was a really uh, good, intense place to, um, yeah, just, Put Caleb under big yeah, pressure. Yeah, lots, lots and lots of pressure. Mm-hmm. Well, that segues nicely into the next question because the joy of this book is that relationship between Caleb and his brother Ant, and it's 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 beautifully multi-layered. It's cuts this way and that way. Two people, they're flawed. They love each other. They hate each other. There's frailties. There's regrets. How do you go about building this beautiful relationship between two people that resonates? Because we all, whether it's our friends or our siblings we recognize that push and pull that Caleb and Ant have I think it's what I think it's the main reason I write actually is um I'm really interested in people and I'm really interested in 
their relationships with other people in whatever form it is. So I'm always thinking about it and, and I'm, I'm fascinated when I see people who obviously love each other but drive each other up the wall and, 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 and like we've all been in situations where we go, oh, my God, if I didn't love you so much, you know. Yeah. Um, but but it, it takes a long time. Uh, unfortunately for, for me, uh, there is a lot of wasted time. Well, no, I'm not going to say wasted. There is a lot of rewriting involved for me um, in just to get the story down, to get everything right. But once that's down, those layers just drop in uh, and go, here's a moment where we can see a little bit more about Caleb and his brother and why maybe they bash heads and and why they shouldn't and and all the, the you know the backstory I'm not going to give you much of the backstory because you can make that up yourself yeah. but but just enough for you to know um why things are the way they are but it's also one of the main reasons why I wanted to make it a series because it just I can just layer it in each book that there is a bit more um yeah okay you can pick up those who perish and and just read it by itself but if you've gone from the beginning, you'll start to see and understand a lot more why, well, Caleb in particular does the stupid things he does. Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's it's not just Caleb and Ant, it's Caleb and Cat and Caleb and Cat's family. It's there's this is beautifully layered um, relationships that go ac- across all the books. You're right that you you take that that um that journey with with Caleb and understand who he is and why he is and how he, why he relates to people in, in particular ways. Yeah, I mean, because I, I don't pre-plan, um, but, but that's the one thing I, I knew. I just had a feeling from the beginning of Resurrection Day, I had the emotional arc for him mm-hmm. over the series. Um, so I guess I've been writing towards that the whole time. Yeah. Now, you said, you said <laughs> at a book launch I went to a while ago that you were going to do five Caleb's and there's only four. No, no, I said three or five. You said, <laughs> I said three or five because I like I like odd numbers. Oh, okay. But when I was writing book two, I knew that three wasn't enough and I knew that five was padding it out and, and, and somebody actually said, you know, you can write four. <laughs> An even number? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> no, it's terrible. But, but I... I can see myself writing another series. Yeah, like, come Another on. little, you know, I'm going to yeah. do something else first, but I... I am very, I wish I wasn't such a slow writer, but I am very drawn to doing a little jump in time and just seeing how he's getting on, you know, five yeah. years down the track. Oh, I'd love to check in with him, yeah. Mm. <laughs> now, I'm going to mention the C word, COVID, um, and how it might impact or affect your writing. But I read, I don't know if anyone else read Michael Conley's latest. He very much yeah. minds the book right now. So Bosch is wearing a mask, there's COVID, there's, Black Lives Matters, there's Trump, there's it's right in here and now, but I was adding it to Goodreads and I started to read the comments and there were people who were outraged by him miring it in COVID and having Bosch wear a mask and seeing it in political terms, mm-hmm. it's like somehow Bosch had um, betrayed them with his politics. So I, I sort of thought, have you been reading the same books that I have? I think pretty sure Bosch has been up. Anyway, the whole COVID mask wearing business really got people up in arms. So I'm wondering how you, you want to take, well, do you want to take on COVID? Do you want to just ignore it? Or do you want to acknowledge it in your books? How, how do you want to, or do you want to acknowledge what's going on in the world in future books? Well, Emma and I actually met up halfway through I, I can't even remember where. It was halfway through last year, actually. Yeah. I can remember now. Yeah. And um, we both were talking about our book to each other and both said, are you talking about COVID? And we both went, no, who wants to talk about COVID? <laughs> like, we yeah. live in it. Like, you want to escape it. And especially at, I could see all the people in the bookshop were so desperate to to escape it because it is so, it's all encompassing. Um, so I think, it'll be ages before I actually want to talk about it in a book. And also because I'm a solo writer, I'm, I'm really hoping by the time I finish the next book, it's, it's done and we've, we've done it. But, I mean, that said, I've seen really interesting ways of people doing it and I've been lucky enough to read Solari's, speaking of Solari from before, her next book, and she deals with it in a very smart way. I, re- I really appreciated her way because it's a, a double kind of narrative and one narrative has they're dealing with COVID and the other narrative you're totally not so um 
in a way, she's having her cake and eating it too because you're not kind of having to absorb it all the time. I thought, ah, you are so clever. But, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. What do you think, Mary Rose? Do you think you'll approach it? Oh, look, I... In the, I'm working on another novel manuscript now and it's kind of set just before COVID, but it was something, it was an idea that I'd kind of started before COVID as well. So, yeah, I don't really want, but I can see a time where it's, because, I, yeah, I don't know, like it might go for another two, three, five years, whether, you know, wearing, so I can see that it will bleed, it, it could well bleed into something else that I write, but not, for the next one, mm. I don't think if yeah if it mm. what happens yeah I mean I had a moment of panic um, in terms of writing those who perish because I thought oh god what do I do about COVID and I realised I had a free pass because I was writing a series and Caleb is in like a parallel now mm. you know it's now or it's five years time or it's yeah, ten years ago. Time. You no, know, so it could be any time. Yeah. No, yeah, it's 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 meant to feel as contemporary as when you're reading it. It's a little hard with technology, which I can't not mention. I try not to go into too many. So I, I got a free pass with that. I get a free pass with my current manuscript too because it's historical. Um, oh. So I, I, I absolutely, I'm sure I will write about it one day. But um, the things take time. It takes time to process yeah. things. And, and and I think for most people, definitely for me, um, it's not true for everyone. Um, it, it, I, I just need to process it. And, and that, that, that takes years, really. Yeah, um, I think you're right. I think it needs to be a distance before mm. we can go, okay, I can write about this. Mm, mm. Yeah. I think Chris Hammer's latest novel, it kind of ends with, you know, COVID kind of on the horizon. Like he mentioned mm, on the horizon. So. Yeah. 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 I haven't read that, read it yet. Yeah. Mm. Mm. I have to say we have not had a single customer who's come into the shop saying, please give me a book. That's going to be surprising. But it was so interesting to read novels, like, you know, when Laura Jean McKay's book came out. Mm. Um, sorry. What are, animals animals in, in this country. country. Yeah, animals yeah. in this country. The way, you know, just serendipitously mm. it was about a virus. And I found mm. that really, I loved that, ex well, you know, I just love that um, parallel of her writing that novel and it coming out just as yeah, yeah that was I perfect. Was us all. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I, I was joking that if you'd been reading young adult dystopian novels, you'd be fine with this. With this <laughs> mm. <laughs> well, one of my fa favorite novels of all time is Station Eleven by Emily St. John yeah. Mandel. Yeah. Let me tell you, for a while in my magical thinking world, I thought that Fairfield was quite well protected because I've sold that book to so many people in Fairfield <laughs> that they all knew what to do with a virus that was going to kill them. So, <laughs> <laughs> Now, I'm conscious of time, and as much as I'm loving this, we, we do have to start to wrap it up. I'm going to start by, oh, sorry, I'm going to end by asking what's next and do you have any in-person book or online book launches that you would like to let everyone know about i've got a few coming out um so those who perish is i think officially out it must be tuesday um yeah march 1st um the book launch is a little bit later i think at 28th of march at, in readings okay. um but there's going to be things in melbourne and other states as well um so maybe it's probably easier to go go to my website um and and yeah. check, check, check them out because it'll be constantly constantly changing so you you mentioned a historical manuscript. Yeah, yeah. I'm in the early stages. This is a this is a book that's been in my brain for like a decade more. Um, it's it's sort of it's inspired by a bit of family history set between the wars, um, and I can't say much about it. No, you don't <laughs> uh, yeah, to. I it's know what it, you. really different. I'm dealing with a lot of the same themes as the Caleb books, you know, identity and 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 family and stuff like that but yeah a very very different yeah feel and protagonist yeah Aoife um yeah so uh when we fall is out the day after Emma's so uh Wednesday so we've all got fingers crossed Emma that uh supply chains hold up and all <laughs> shops get their books um but I'm sure they will um I I'm denied about a launch but I've got um 
two kids at school and I get notified by COVID cases every day and my eldest has got got uh, came down with COVID yesterday. Oh, so yeah. uh, so I just I thought it's just too stressful. So I'm going to hold off and maybe when I feel right, have a party that won't be a real launch, but it'll just be a hooray. I finished the book <laughs> later down the track and I've got stuff coming up as well um, that I can't quite talk about. So um, but it will all be revealed and launched later on. And um, right. I'm really hoping that we get more in-person events happening mm -hmm. soonish. I hope mm. your child's okay too. Yeah, he's totally fine uh, at this stage. <laughs> Mary Rose? Uh, yeah, so um, the cane's been out for about three three weeks or so. So I was meant to have a launch, a live launch, but it was put off. But so now there's kind of a delayed launch. 17th of March at Readings Emporium. It's kind of, but it's more like a, it's an in-conversation event. It's um, put on with in association with... Sisters in Crime. So I'm going to be talking to Philomena, Dr. Philomena oh, Horsley, who's a um, previous winner of the Scarlet Stiletto and convener of the David Awards. So that should be really good. So you can go to the reading site and it'll direct you to the tribal king site if you'd like to come along to that on the 17th of March. Excellent. Thank you very much. Now, I have to finish with the raffle. And we have to choose three lucky ticket holders. So I'm going to ask you each to choose a number between 1 and 55. So I think 1 and 55. Right. Emma, give me a number. 25. 25. And the winner is Meg. Uh, I don't have a... Oh, I'm going to have to give you a surname. Meg Buxton, you are a winner. Yay. Eva, <laughs> can you pick a number? Six. So what was that? Six. Six. Lucy Six. Torrens, you are a winner. <laughs> yeah. Oh, no, Lucy. Well done, Lucy. <laughs> <laughs> and Mary Rose, pick a number. 43. 43. Bev Murrell, you are a winner. All right. I'm going to have to. I have to so who was it? What was the other numbers? It was. 25. Six. 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 I'm just highlighting those so I can give them to Lindy. All right. Thank you very much for that thank and good luck i mean well done all the winners um i'm going to finish up you can buy all three of these great books from sisters in crime long-term support of the sun bookshop in yarraville of course other books but go to go to the sun and the sun has an online service now so if you don't live in yarraville and parts there about you can um, order online this event will be going up on sisters in crime youtube channel there you will find other events plus our murder monday interviews with both australian and overseas crime authors, including Val McDermott, Kathy Reich, Sarah Paretsky, Anne Cleves, and Louise Candlish. Keep in touch with Sisters in Crime through the, their website. You can sign up for monthly e-newsletters, a stab in the dark, or better still join, and you can follow Sisters on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you, Aoife. Thank you, Emma. Thank you, Mary Rose. It's been fantastic. I've really enjoyed this. Thanks to everyone who joined us. And um, stay safe and stay healthy. And we'll see you very soon and, and hopefully in person. Yay. Yay. Thank you. Thanks, Jackie. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. See you, Emma. Bye. 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 Bye.